Welcome back. Last time we discussed the need to recognize that Islamic philosophy did not end with its influence upon the West, and this time we'll provide an overview of four phases in the development of Islamic philosophy. This is not to be absolute. There are many different ways of doing it, but I think it's a very convenient way of presenting the periods of Islamic philosophy to make it stick in our minds and to bring out the characteristics of each period which we'll discuss in somewhat greater detail in the following segments. The first period is the classical period of Islamic thought. The first major school of Islamic philosophy, and the best known in the West, is the Mashai, which was founded in the rich intellectual atmosphere of Baghdad by Abu Ya'qub al-Kindi in the 9th century. The word Mashai is an exact Arabic translation of the Greek word peripatetic meaning one who takes a walk. When Aristotle taught, he used to walk with his students. Thus, his school was known as peripatetic. However, the content is not identical. The Mashai was not the school of Aristotle, but in Arabic, as we previously discussed. It was an Islamic philosophical school, which also contained Neoplatonic elements of great importance, but most important of all, were its Qur'anic Islamic elements. From the beginning, it was concerned with the question of Tawheed, of divine unity, of revelation, of creation. Aristotle did not have to bother with creation in time. That's an Abrahamic idea for Muslims, Christians, and Jews. The idea of creation in that sense does not fit in the Greco-Roman religious perspective for profound metaphysical reasons that I cannot discuss here. So it's not that this was simply Aristotle in Arabic. It was called peripatetic, but it incorporated these three elements into it. The school of Aristotle, Neoplatonism, which is the thought derived from Plotinus, and before the rise of Islam, there were a lot of Neoplatonic philosophers who were themselves reading Aristotle and commenting upon him, and Islam itself. The major themes of this philosophy come from the Islamic revelation. The question of divine unity, the creation of the world, the question of divine will as related to the laws of nature, and all of these problems with which all religious philosophies deal. So the first period is the period of the birth and gradual maturing of this philosophy. Al-Kindi expressed the principle of the need to assimilate truth claims, whatever their source, into the synthetic perspective of Islam. Because God was truth, al-Haq, all truths came from him and testified to him. Al-Kindi stated, quote, We should not be ashamed to acknowledge truth and to assimilate it from whatever source it comes to us, even if it is brought to us by former generations and foreign peoples. For him who seeks the truth, there is nothing of higher value than truth itself. It never cheapens or abases him who reaches for it, but ennobles and honors him." Unquote. This school provided proofs for God's existence, his names and qualities, divine justice, and other theological questions, taking a middle position between Tenzi and Teshbih on the nature of divine names and attributes, analogous to the Ashrites, but denying that God could will that good be evil and vice versa, analogous to the Mu'tazilites. The Mashai philosophers therefore agreed with Asharite conclusions on some points, Mu'tazilite conclusions on other points, and disagreed with both on still other points, such as occasionalism mentioned in our readings and to which we'll return in another segment. But the Mashai school couldn't adequately address questions regarding God's knowledge of particulars, such as God's knowledge of every leaf that falls, as the Qur'an asserts, and faced fierce opposition from scholars of Kalam on the question of the creation of the world ex nihilo, out of nothing, since the philosophers maintained that God always was a creator. There was no satisfactory answer to these problems until later phases in the development of Islamic philosophy. And Mashai philosophers didn't even attempt to provide a philosophical proof for bodily resurrection. They accepted it as a matter of faith. 
The second phase involved the theological critique highlighting these difficulties in Meshe'i philosophy in the 11th and 12th centuries. Political factors also contributed to the decline and influence of Islamic philosophy in the eastern lands of Islam, since intellectual differences could be politicized, as we see so often today. But the Western view that this critique heralded the end of philosophy in Islam is wholly incorrect, as we previously discussed. Although this stage marked the beginning of the end of the influence of Islamic philosophy upon Western philosophy, it did not mark the end of Islamic philosophy itself, which had two more stages of development addressing these problems that most Western scholars were completely unaware of until the middle of the 20th century. After the influential theological critique of the Mashai school, Islamic philosophy entered a third phase with the founding of a new school, the Illuminationist or Ishraqi in Persia, and the exposition of doctrinal Sufism. The school of illumination provided a remarkable new framework to solve the problem of God's knowledge of particulars, and various scholars started to bring about a rapprochement between various schools of Islamic thought from the 13th to 16th centuries. The final phase of Islamic philosophy is a period of synthesis marked by the founding of yet another school of philosophy called Hikmat al-Muta'aliya, or Transcendent Philosophy, during the 17th century onward, that resolved the debate over the creation of the world ex nihilo in terms of a hierarchy of levels of time, and provided a philosophical proof for bodily resurrection, leaving no outstanding philosophical problems in reaching the tenets of the faith. This school synthetically unites Mashai philosophy, Ishraqi philosophy, doctrinal Sufism, the Kalam tradition, and the Islamic revelation, along with the sayings of the Prophet and the Shiite Imams. This phase therefore represents the grand synthesis of the different currents of Islamic thought. That concludes our introductory overview of the history of Islamic philosophy. Next time we'll turn to the first phase in the rise of the Mashai school with the translation of Greek and other texts into Arabic.